Hello and welcome to the annual Write Hive conference. This year is jam packed with a ton of great sessions for writers, writing professionals, and the publishing industry. Write Hive is a nonprofit serving the writing community with resources, events, programming, connections, and more. The 2022 conference brings you this session Body Positive Representation in Fiction. I'm Justine Manzano, and I will be serving as both the moderator of the discussion and a panelist myself. I am the YA author of Never Say Never, a contemporary novel with a plus size protagonist. And I am also a freelance editor and an editor in residence here at Write Hive. Um, Lainey, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lainey Bynum. Uh, I am an author and a co-owner of Sword and Silk Books. Um, we at Sword and Silk Books try to produce um, books of fiction that incorporate all kinds of different body styles as well as any other kind of disability or chronic illness or anything that is not commonly represented in fiction. Michael? I'm Michael G. Williams. I write a bunch of different series. I write horror, science fiction, and urban fantasy at the moment. Uh, most of my books are published by Falstaff Books, and it, my horror series is about a 350-pound vampire who lives in suburbia and is very much not the, um, the like, the twink who, you know, flies in the window and is forever 17. And, uh, <laughs> and I have a science fiction series that starts with a detective who has terminal cancer. Beatrice? Yeah, hi, my name is Beatrice Winifred Eicher. Um, I write primarily horror. Um, I really like historical horror. That is my niche. Um, recently, um, I have been published by Faya Magazine. And um, next up, I have Fantasy Magazine and Air Nothingness Press. And I'm really excited uh, this fall, I have, I'm gonna be in a horror BIPOC anthology called uh, Death in the Mouth. And I'm really pumped about it. Um, which yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. So great to meet, well, I, I'm actually, I know Lainey already, but it's so great to meet you, Michael, and you, Beatrice. Um, and I'm really excited to get started. So our first question today, is why is it important for different body types to be represented in books? Whoever wants to jump in, go for it. Um, I guess I, I can go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for me, growing up, um, I have been a fairly curvy girl my whole life. And without the representation um, in books, in fiction, magazines, um, even, you know, like cartoons and Disney movies and things like that, you grow up feeling like there's something wrong with you, that, that there's some otherness that you just don't, you don't fit into the world the way these main characters that you're seeing fit into the world. And it, it's hard to go through life feeling like that, that otherness um, until you get old enough to realize that we're all different and that there's so much more than what you see in the mainstream. And so for me, it's really important to have books out there that show a variety so that people understand that the world is much bigger and that the, the people of the world are much more diverse than what they're constantly being fed in the media. 100%. <laughs> yeah, a, I think, uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, um, I think Lainey really, uh, I, I really like what you said about, is it's kind of not about specifically um, seeing fat representation or seeing a certain kind of body type it's more of, I want more of everything. And I think for so long we've had just one body type that um, we're shown in all types of media. 
And so I think it's um, it's important to have all body corporate all body type represented because um, being seen is a really powerful thing. Be feeling seen is really powerful and it can really uh, can really change your life. And so that's what I think. Yeah, I'm I'm a gay man and there is a ton of like a ton of preconceived notions that are imposed from within, within the queer communities on like what bodies are acceptable, what body types are okay, you know, what bodies are welcome at Pride, what bodies are welcome at the gay bar, you know, that sort of stuff, uh, to the point that there are different gay bars for different body types, you know, and there's, you know, I happen to live near a town where there's like, there's the Twink and College Kids Bar, and then there's the Bear Bar, you know, and like bears who go to the twink bar are kind of looked at a little bit like, you know, what are you doing here? And vice versa. And it's, there's a ton of, of uh, I'm trying to think of what the word for it is, but I'm not coming up with one. There's a ton of a sense of like, you have to look a certain way and be shaped a certain way. And uh, that's the only way to have value in the gay community. And so it was really important to me in writing, because all of my books are also about queer characters. And it was really important to me to not write books that are just about the one body type that's gonna show up in an underwear ad at Pride Month, you know, uh, that one body type that's gonna show up on the cover of Men's Health or whatever. I feel like, like I really, really agree with what you just said about, like I wanted, all body types. I wanted there to be all kinds of people. I wanted there to be all races, all ethnicities, all skin colors, all genders represented in my books because partly, frankly, from a business sense, I don't want to make anybody who might read it and enjoy it feel unwelcome, you know, and partly because in a just a human sense, like I want every person to have the opportunity to like reach for that book and feel that it reaches back for them, you know, that that story welcomes them into it instead of them having to wonder whether they would be welcome there. Like as a kid, I watched or I read Nancy Drew books. That was like my big thing. And I loved them. And Nancy Drew had a friend who was bigger. It was like constantly the butt of the joke for that reason. And even as a kid, even as like a little prepubescent skinny kid, it really bothered me. And now as like a middle-aged dude with a body that's just like every other body out there, then uh, that really, that's something that I felt like a need to actively push against in my work. We see so much of what you're, what you're saying. Like, it's not even just not representing larger bodies. Um, it's also mocking differences there's so much of that in any in, in differences of any kind you know mental health disorders um sexuality gender uh race all of that we they, people like to poke fun at the different and um when i was writing Bryn and i i did a, a little bit of it and i i try to avoid putting too much of a, a accent on the fact that she was a larger girl because I grew up just like, you know, I grew up curvy and I was always questioned about my weight, my health, like, am I okay? Or what could I do to be better? And I was one of those people that if you pick, pick a year when, you know, I'm either super skinny or I'm like, I've grown quite a bit in between because I would yo-yo back and forth. Um, it wasn't about eating right. It was about how much weight can I lose and how quickly. And that was all because of the fact that we're basically taught that weight, larger weights are jokes or are disgusting or unhealthy. And so it's like this rush of, oh, how do I properly show myself to the world? Um, and it gets you, it, it's not good for you. It's, it's an unhealthy way to live your life. And the more protagonists that we see that are more like us, the more that we can feel like, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. 
Um, it's, it, it's even, I mean, you see stuff like that even nowadays in social media. I mean, I posted a picture. I lost, I lost a lot of weight. I went on a, a healthy eating journey and I was really excited about it because it was a, a, a health choice. It wasn't a weight choice at all. It was, uh, uh, I am starting to have like high cholesterol and getting older. And I was like, okay, well I got to cut some things out. Right. And I posted a picture of like, well, I lost 40 something pounds and I was really proud of myself. And I posted a before and after picture and I got the, you know, you're always going to get that one jerk on Twitter. Right. So I get the one jerk who says you could still lose more. I, 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 well, for one thing, I, I did what I think was the funnier thing, which is I, I, through the, through the person to the wolves. I was basically like, I'm not even going to comment on this, but look at what this guy did and just waited for all my Twitter followers to eviscerate him. Um, I was a wolf. <laughs> Number one, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was like, but it was more like a, a situation of like, I don't even know how to handle this because I've been doing this all my life. And like, I, I don't have the energy to argue about why that doesn't mean I'm unhealthy or why, you know, that it wasn't that I didn't lose weight because I don't want to look bad for random people. It's because I was doing it for a health reason. Um, and I also am not losing anymore. I'm like, oh, I'm healthy now. Okay. I'm good. Um, and the thing is like to find that level of comfort, it's very hard because of the way that the media puts out this idea of who we should look like and what we should be. And it's a difficult thing to like shed that when you've seen it all your life. Um, I do feel like we're moving in the right direction. I feel like we're moving too slowly though. Um, but I am happy to see like kids look at representation in, in media and just be so happy to see a black superhero or, um, or like any, anybody like them, you know, like in Kanto, like you see kids like that, that kid looks like me, they have my hair. And it's just like, <laughs> it's it, it, cause you know, like, I, I mean, even, even as far as like, as a kid, when, when I would watch superhero shows and I always wanted the, the female superhero and they like, they were in like two seconds of the show. And one day I walked into Toys R Us and I saw a wall of female superheroes and I, I, I made my son confused, but I like, I teared up and he's like, mom, what, what are you doing? Um, but it's just, it means so much to see anybody who is like you take that position of a hero or the main character. And it just feels like, okay, like I, I'm okay. Like there are other people like me and um, you know, that like, like Beatrice said, like feeling seen is so powerful. Um, I have, um, uh, what, what were you going to say? Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, I noticed that especially in, um, in romance where the entire goal of romance is a happily ever after. I, I love the romance genre. I mean, I absolutely love it. And I, I, I devour it as a reader, but as I started to write it, I realized that a lot of the main characters weren't like me in a lot of ways um and it makes you feel like you don't deserve that happy ever after that only the this you know the pretty people who have their life together and they're wearing the stiletto heels and they know how to do makeup really well like it's it's always plot points in books you know they they love these designer labels and and they're dressed to the nines and like you know the the high heels and the slacks and the button down shirts and and when I started writing, I was like, I'm not like that. I, I want to write people that, that are like me. They don't, they don't have their stuff together. <laughs> you know, their life is chaos. <laughs> They're good to, you know, get in a shower, <laughs> which lets do all their makeup and wear high heels. High heels aren't like, they're not feasible for an average high school day. And you read YA and you've got people in stilettos, like you're going to break your neck, girl. Like, <laughs> so I wanted, I wanted to write what felt comfortable for me because I knew that my experience was not individual, that my experience was a universal shared experience that a lot of people had gone through. You know, when I would wake up for high school, when I was a kid, 
or when I was in high school, I guess, I wore jeans, a t-shirt, a hoodie, some black eyeliner. And if I was lucky, I straightened my hair that morning. I had like 15 minutes to get ready and get out the door and hope I wasn't late. <laughs> so it wasn't like, so I wanted to write books where the main character got a happily ever after without having to be beautiful or put together in order to deserve it. Um, and I think that we see a lot of that in romance um, and especially romantic comedies and, and things like that. And also for, for men, for the male yeah. side too. Yeah. All of the men have washboard abs and all of this. And it's like, also like how many people do you know that actually have washboard abs? Um, <laughs> I mean, like maybe one here and there. Like, I mean, the average, if I remember correctly, and I could be mis totally misquoting this uh, percentage here, but I, I'm pretty sure the majority of women are 12 and up size-wise, at least 12 and up. And, mm -hmm. and, and I like, I, I live in New York city, so I would sit on the train and I would just be like, probably horribly what people watching. Cause no one wants people watching for like their body type, but I'm sitting there like, she's like me. She's like me. Oh, that's one that's skinny. Okay. She's like me. And it's like, yeah, it's true. Like most of the people on the train, most of the normal people that were around me were a, a bit like they weren't the model size. Um, you know, like it wasn't, it's not representative of what is really out there. Um, and it was so important, like you were saying about not doing the heels and not doing all of that. When I was writing Never Say Never, it was so important for Bryn to, to be that way. My main character, she's just, <laughs> Lainey's my publisher. Um, <laughs> she, yeah. Um, so it was so important to me for her to like, look like, your regular, you know, a regular high school student, but also not to vilify the, the, her friends who one of her friends is too much. And then the other one is like a happy medium. She's like always dressed up really nice and very pretty and whatever, and is a little bit of a hot mess inside. But it is it like, and, and all of them were like decent or trying to be decent people. Um, and they all were different because also we all hang out with different people too. We're not sitting there in like a solid group of everyone looking like us either or being exactly, you know, it's not all people of one type. Um, and so I feel like that was a really important thing to me. Like I wanted teens that did just go too far. Like had to, they were like in a beauty contest every time they went to school. But I also wanted the teens that rolled out of bed and gotten their t-shirts and hoodies and went off to school. And that was, you know, cause that was me. I was somewhere in the middle. I would like to, cause I was, I was a little bit of a goth girl. So I would go and, and, you know, do up the makeup and stuff like that. But I'd always be wearing like really comfortable clothes <laughs> somewhere in the middle. I think, um, I think Justine, that's really uh, touching on something that's really important to me, which is inclusivity, because I think, you know, even like Lainey, when you said that, you know, you're the kind of person who, you know, you would never wear heels to school and you or you know, the things like that, where I, I feel like with inclusivity comes all of these different types of people who some may want to wear heels for whatever reason, some they got their bands and that's all they need. And then some, you know, they wear Jordans. Like I, and, and I, I feel like having that whole spectrum of people again with the not just one having a spectrum of uh body types of personalities of you know interests and hobbies and everything all of these different aspects of us as a person um if we have i think inclusivity in um in authors i think that also helps having inclusivity on the page and I think, um, you know, body diversity is a really interesting topic to me because a lot of the times, you know, like we were saying before, when you grow up and you look different than other people, you can sometimes have this like bruise inside and just kind of feel like something's not quite right. It could be me. I, I hope it's not me. I hope it's them. But like, you know, you grow up and you feel a little different. And I think I, I worry that sometimes as we, we bring that 
with us when we become adults and we bring that bruise and all the different feelings that come along with that positive and negative we put that into our writing or we're too afraid to write the truth because the truth is too difficult to write or the truth is scary to write or you know no one else is writing this type of stuff people don't want to read about you know a fat envy who like it there's so many different you know uh roadways that we occupy I think it can be so beautiful and I really think inclusivity is what we should root our um our writing in and I think that biodiversity again is just so important to me I think it's so cool to think about um yeah I wanted to say that yeah well, I, I, go ahead. Oh, sorry I was just going to say, because I think that's what makes humankind beautiful, is that we are all so different. And that if we do have the inclusivity and we do bring everybody kind of closer together, th th there's really no stopping us. I mean, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but when you have, this is kind of the reason that indie authors, indie publishers is is such a big deal to me is because you, if you only have a certain select kind of people controlling the entire industry, you only see a certain select kind of book being published. And, and yeah, growing up without representation in the media and without representation in fiction and things, it does leave like this trauma that as an adult, you have to, you have to kind of work through and and try to really unpack, hey, how much of that was actually me, you know, putting those expectations on myself and how much was the world putting those expectations on me and what should I have listened to and what shouldn't I have listened to? Whereas kids nowadays, I know my daughter is 11 years old and she's growing up in a world where she could be anything she wanted to be because she's seen other people be whatever they want to be. You know, it, if she decides tomorrow that she, you know, is bisexual, there is absolutely nothing. It, it, it's not the way it was 20 years ago, um, especially not in our household. You know, if, if she came to me and said that and be like, oh, okay, awesome. You, you, do you want me to get you a flag? Like, how do you want me to support you? You know, you let me know, you know, you tell me how, you, how I can support you, you know? Um, and if she wakes up tomorrow and decides, hey, mom, you know, I, I feel uncomfortable about this or that or whatever, we can talk about it. We can work through it because she's seen an array of people and she now has that ex those experiences and that knowledge to carry with her throughout her life it's it's not necessarily like it was growing up in the 90s or the early 2000s and it's like you know if you're not Britney Spears or Christina Aguilera we kind of like we didn't know what to be you know wh where did we fit into the world and so we we found our own kind of path through but um kids nowadays they they have more of an example of the paths to take and to kind of keep them from experiencing some of the trauma that we experienced growing up I will say though that I think that the, a large part of that is because you are a good parent and <laughs> you are making sure your child is exposed to the things because there are still a lot of people out there that do not do that and um and do not allow that level of exposure to their kids. Like I purposely seek out media for diff with different representations to show my son um, to, you know, who's 12 years old and who is fighting kids in school about mistreating people of different sexualities and stuff like that and is arguing that out. And that's because, not because I said, oh, you know, put up your dukes, uh, but more because I just introduced him to the different types of people in the world and let him 
accept and understand his own way. And not every parent does that. And there are parents who will look at you know, books or, I mean, you see, you see what's happening in Florida, um, not to get into politics, but yeah, it, there are people who will make sure that their kids know absolutely nothing about um, what can be and who they can be. And so it speaks more to the parent that you are, that you're saying, well, they see a lot of everything because it is out there, but there are people trying to bar it. So, <laughs> um, and I think there always will be, I think, I think just kind of in, in publishing, in the book world, you're always going to have book burners. You're always going to have people that want to ban things from libraries because you're always going to have small-minded people. Um, but the more that's out there for them to absorb, um, you know, the, the more we can reach those, those kids that either do have supportive parents or even reach them once, you know, they're out of that kind of restrictive environment. Something I always tell my son, I'm always like, oh, well, um, yeah, that person's not a very accepting person. They're not a very open-minded person. See how they are when they go to college. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they'll be better. I, I think that one really important reason why people do go after books and libraries and things like that and try to go after writers for having written inclusive stories is that those people do not want an inclusive world, you know, to use Beatrice's term, inclusivity. Uh, I think that they know that reading a book that is inclusive is a, an experience that they cannot mediate that their child is having. They can't get between their kid and a book. The kid, if they read a book that has a, a wide array of characters and of body types and of every possible identity and experience that that child might either be or encounter in their life, then uh, there's nothing that that parent can do to stop that kid from learning from that once the book is in their hand. You know, reading is like such a personal conversation between the author and the reader, regardless of the age of the reader. And I feel like those parents who do not want an inclusive world, they want an exclusive world, uh, those parents know that they can't compete with that personal relationship. I, I think a big part of making that work to open kids' minds is for the inclusivity to be there and for those characters all to have agency and for them to be taken seriously. And uh, for the characters to all have a moment where, at least one moment, where like each of them gets to be right, each of them gets to be powerful, mm -hmm. each of them gets yeah. to like have a point from their own experience that, that maybe nobody else in the book would have had or thought of. And you know that opportunity for that kid or that adult or whoever to have that moment when empathy sparks because they've had some assumption challenged by what's in the book, you know, where their assumptions about the state of the world suddenly are called into question by what they're seeing on the page. And uh, I think that's a really important and powerful moment. I think that especially when it comes to body positivity, because advertising is like so prevalent everywhere and advertising tells them that there are, are one or two types of bodies that are acceptable. And that's not just about size, that's also about skin color and about race and about ethnicity and about gender expression and about everything. It's about their sexuality. It's about you know, how they're allowed to be and live as adults. And advertising will tell them many times over in the course of their childhood that if they don't have those things or are not those things already, then they've effectively failed at a moral choice and that's it. And they just aren't important anymore. And a book where people who don't fit that mold are allowed to be important, it's gonna be really powerful for that kid. Um, that's like the Fahrenheit 451, the firemen. Yeah. The, one of the big themes of the book is that you cannot fight ideas and books give ideas. So they were trying to burn all the books because ideas are contagious. You can't kill them. Mm -hmm. Once you expose children or even adults, because I mean, we've focused on adolescents and, and children in this conversation so far, but there's a lot of adults that haven't experienced this stuff so far. Um, you know, I, I'm 35 years old. I'm still meeting people my age that they may have 
lived as one body type their entire life. And now there's, you know, in their mid thirties and they're starting to gain weight and they're like, I never realized, you know, how bad I was or how mean I was to people that didn't look like me until I didn't look like me. Um, and, you know, it, exposing even those adults, anyone who hasn't come in contact with those ideas to those ideas, you can't fight it from there. Once they have empathy for one character who, you know, lives with that, then they start to see the world in a whole new way. And I think that's why it's really important in fiction to, to expose them to that. So when you're writing different body types, how do you tackle issues of body image in a positive manner? Like what are, because I know that some, sometimes it can be hard um, and we have new writers that that's part of what Ride Hive is. Like, how do you, how do you tackle those body issue, uh, body image issues when you're writing in a way that, that is um, positive and is not, feeding it. I think for me, um, injecting humor into this situation has helped me a little bit just because I like to fancy myself a humorous person. Um, and it's kind of my writing style to inject humor into serious moments, but, um, to have a, my books technically, not the ones I publish, but the ones I write have kind of the greater story arc of this is where they started. You know, they may have started insecure. They may have started in a situation where they didn't necessarily accept things about themselves. They didn't necessarily love themselves the, the way that they wanted. Um, in one of my books called Adeline's Aria, she stands next to her, her best friend and compares herself. She says, you know, here's a, a uh, I can't remember what she called her, but you know, this extravagant dessert and then here's me and I'm just a plain piece of white bread. You know, like she just, she doesn't feel great about herself, but through the things she goes through, she starts realizing that her worth was never dependent on her image. And towards the end of the book, she's realizing that she is worth something, that, that her, you know, her body image her confidence grows um, to where she realizes that she doesn't have to put up with just whatever from anybody just because she doesn't look the way she thinks she needs to look. Um, so I think, like I said, injecting humor into it for me, um, even if it's self-depreciating humor sometimes, and then to come back and, and be like, okay, well, this is how I felt about myself. And now you, you take your reader kind of on a journey of self-growth with your character um, is kind of how I've tried to do that. <laughs> um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to say, uh, I feel like it's possible that Beatrice will share the first thing that came to my mind, which was, all right, horror. So it's not going to be super nice, <laughs> but I really enjoy writing it. Uh, <laughs> Definitely. I uh, I made my character the most powerful monster in the book. You know, I have a vampire series called The Wither Chronicles. That's about the vampire who weighs three hundred fifty pounds, and he's kind of a old hillbilly. And uh, now he like lives in the suburbs in the southeast, and he's the vampire lord of his state, as far as he knows. But he's also like. The guy that his neighbors don't like very much and uh and he's they think of him as just like to be really frank they just think of him as like the fat weirdo down the street who like never mows his own lawn and never we never see him at anything and uh and i his body is one of the ways that he gains the upper hand over other people because a he is physically powerful by virtue of being a vampire but also he was always physically powerful he was always strong People would always have been surprised by how strong he was. But also he knows that people look at him and stop taking him seriously. You know, if he's just like walking around Target at one in the morning, then he thinks he knows that people are not going to, they're just gonna, gonna look right past him because he has a body type that people are trained to believe they should not pay attention to. And if that's what gives him the ability to catch them by surprise, then great. You know, if he has the ability to have people 
not take him seriously and then flip that on them so that his monstrosity uh, is able to, you know, he's able to do whatever he needs to do as a vampire, then that's wonderful. If he's able to use other people's prejudices against them, um, that's really important to his story. He has a cousin who is also a vampire. It's the South, everybody has a cousin and they're all vampires. And, uh, and that cousin is like a very, very small bodied person. And people also do not take him seriously for the same, you know, for different reasons, but effectively the same thing. They just expect he's not ever gonna have the upper hand over them. And that's something that he deploys constantly to catch people by surprise. And it's that way of saying, okay, fine, if you're gonna have an idea about my body ahead of time, then I'm gonna use that idea against you. And if that means that a bunch of really prejudiced people die, oh, well, too bad, you know? Well, now that I'm scared to go to Target at one o'clock in the morning in my little Southeast um, su suburb, so. <laughs> Um, I think in in my writing, um, I, I do write horror, so you're, you're right, Michael, it would be slightly different. But uh, in in my writing, what I do is I don't really address it. And it's just kind of a very normal part of the day. You move your body in certain ways because that's the way your body moves. And, you know, I think there is a like quiet strength in not really addressing things and just kind of saying this is the way life is. I'm not gonna I don't care enough to change it. This is this is this is who I am. So I think that's um that's this if I that actually kind of works for horror because um that's kind of the what I use to make um the dread where it's kind of like everything's fine there's no problem there's no problem here nothing could possibly happen here and then shit goes down but you know that's 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 what i like to do for me um i decided that while the outside world seemed to care a lot about bryn's body type bryn didn't really um she wasn't bothered by it she just like people kept commenting on it and it's like no, that has nothing to do with anything leave me alone um and that's sort of how I tackled that because it's like she had a lot of stuff going on in the story her her mother's getting or her parents are getting divorced and her best friend just broke up with her boyfriend and she's trying to help them and she doesn't believe in love and Aphrodite's trying to set her up on dates and she um it's a weird story <laughs> and she uh just it, like she's got enough going on and why does why does Aphrodite keep trying to get her you know all dressed up in all this fancy these fancy clothes and and complaining that she hides her body she's like I don't hide my body I wear baggy stuff because that's what I'm comfortable in and you know I don't care um, and spends the whole time sort of like okay can we stop talking about that because it doesn't have anything to do with this um and it doesn't in the end all of the stuff all everything is resolved in a way that has absolutely nothing about to do with Bryn's appearance and everyone else is all worried about it um and and calling her names and saying stupid things around her but it, none of this stuff was important because it had nothing to do with her life and her story um so that was I, I was trying to basically uh, write like how I feel on a daily basis. Like I'm not sitting there looking, thinking about, oh my, I don't fit this right. And oh no, like I don't care. Like I'm just here. I'm, I have my body. I am the way I am. And I, that really doesn't play in with any of the stuff I'm worried about right now. <laughs> so when people commented on it, it's like, okay, sorry. I'm sorry that I offend you with my, with your eyes, with my, appearance but I really don't care and it has no impact on me um so that like that's kind of how I go about it with a very much very much like you know this is a non-issue that you're making into an issue um so when you're I know that it's it can be hard for some writers to avoid the stereotypes that we have been taught about people of different body types when they're writing because it is implanted in our brains from the time that we're children. Like, you know, like, oh, 
I mean, I, the number of people I see that are fat characters that are eating like whole slices of cake, like, come on, like, that, that's not a thing. But <laughs> like, oh, look, a cake. Like, nobody actually does that. But like, this sto there are stories like that. Like, you still see stuff like that. So in what ways do you ensure that you're not when you're writing stories? And I feel like this is probably easier for us because we have lived, you know, lives where we have extra weight and th this is our body type. But I feel like it's easier for us to, to explain to people, like, how do you avoid these negative stereotypes? How do you, and it's true for, I think, any different, like any, when you're writing inclusively in general, yeah. like, how do you avoid using those things that have been ingrained in us about different body types or different types of people? And or maybe even turn it on its ear. Like, how do you do that as a writer? You're each personal. I think for me, a lot of it is just realizing that regardless of the physical traits that someone may have, they're human. And you're writing a character as a human. Well, I mean, unless they're a vampire. Um, <laughs> Or anything else. Yeah. <laughs> they are the norm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, they'll they're gonna have interests, they're gonna have things that they love, things that they hate, um, favorite foods, favorite uh songs, so much outside of just whether or not, you know, they may be overweight, underweight, you know gender preference, sexuality preference, aside from all of that, they're also going to be human and have a very shared human experience. And, um, and that's something that people forget for people a lot. We want to say this certain group only likes these things or only behaves this way or only, we wanna put them in a box um, and, Humanity doesn't work in boxes. We we don't work well with labels. You try to label humanity as something and it's gonna shuck that label and prove you wrong. Um, and I think for me, the, the biggest thing is just to flesh out those characters as three-dimensional and, and make it more than just about um, the body or the uh, the preferences, you know, make them into a person who has a backstory that has shaped who they are as a character. Even if that backstory is they grew up with extra weight, maybe their their parents didn't know how to handle it and put them in, you know, camps or put them on diets from a young age that can be part of the story but that's going to affect your character that's not going to make your character um so I, I think a good way to avoid those stereotypes is just to ask yourself you know is this something that actually would fit my character's personality rather than is this something that i'm pulling from another character or another observation that doesn't fit this character's personality. I think for me, it's really important that I never let those characters be successfully victimized on the basis of whatever it is. It's, they're gonna live in a world where prejudices exist against them, you know, and Withrow is very aware that he lives in a world where people are very prejudiced against him for his body type. Um, but I never let anybody successfully victimize him over that. I don't even let anybody really unsuccessfully try to victimize him over that. Like he's aware that it exists, but it's not anything, you know, that he's been much attacked for. Um, it's really important to me that I not like try to gin up some really shallow emotion out of readers by like re-traumatizing them basically. And so I just try really hard to make sure that nobody gets to like successfully weaponize these things against my characters, that these characters can navigate the story without this being something that, um, that damages them and by extension damages the reader. 
I would say, um, Justine, I know you said that this could be helpful for people who may not have, or who, to, who are writing cross, you know, I don't know the word for that. I was gonna say cross culturally. I guess there is fat culture, it's but similar. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> not quite. You know what I'm saying more of, you know, if, if, if that is something that you're doing, then I feel like um, you should ask yourself, what are you trying to say? By, by having this character and by addressing it in, in any way, whether it is successfully or unsuccessfully victimizing them or having other characters victimize them or by ignoring it or, or anything. I think you should, with this kind of thing, be intentional with what you're doing. Um, so I wouldn't say, I think everyone should have a fat character in their story because I don't know what everyone is trying to say in having that black character or that black or that fat or that whatever kind of character in their story. So I, that would be my, uh, my advice is just to think about it for a second. What are you trying to say by having this type of a person in your story? Um, because I've been, that, that answer will then shape what you do next. Because, you know, if you're trying to say, if you're trying to make a statement about body diversity and about how all bodies should be normalized, then that's different than you saying, I want to prove that fat people can do anything. Those are two different, you know what I'm saying? Those are two different things. So I think you should take a step back and ask yourself why you are writing this very specific kind of person. Yeah, and I think that's true with any kind of diversity that you're introducing into a story. If they are not, yeah, your, if, they, if they don't fall into your own parameters, like that is something I think right. when you're adding. Right. And, and I want to be clear, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying be intentional about what you're doing. Right. And I think that's also an important distinction where I know that there are issues with writing outside of your own race, religion, culture, you know, all of that. And, and while it, it's not about, it's about not trying to tell the stories of the person that you're, you know, that you're like, you're not, I am going to now tell the story of a black woman when I am not black. Like, I can't do that. I don't know, but I can have black characters in my story if I represent them properly and I'm doing it for like, I'm not just doing it to like win my diversity points. I actually have a meaning. And that meaning is I want to show that there are a bunch of different people who do a bunch of different things and they, you know, we all live in the same world and we're inclusive. Um, but like, that is something I've heard a lot from, you know, when, when playing on Twitter and stuff like that. And, and you hear a lot of, well, first there's don't write, you know, you need to write more diversely. And then there's don't write my story and it's like no those are two really different things like <laughs> it's not they're not they're those don't clash it, it's don't write my story for me yeah don't try to steal the story of other people um but do have a wide diverse cast of characters in your story because that the world really looks like that you know and and you want your stories to represent what life really looks like um, I just like jumped in to take that opportunity off of what you said, because I've, I've heard that before that, you know, and I think intention is so important there. And you're so right about that because you, you can do it just to do it, or you can do it and have a purpose. And especially if you're going to be really shining a light on issues that that person faces, you really need to make sure you know what you're saying and why you're saying it. So I a hundred percent agree with you. It's, and it's slippery. It can be a slippery thing. You you might not realize you have your own internal prejudices um, when you're writing, and then you might realize when you're putting it down on paper. That, and you're and if you are using that intentional thought, you might go, oh, you know what? Maybe maybe I'm a little twisted there. Maybe I need to straighten myself out on what you know why I'm doing this. Um, which I think we should all check ourselves because everybody has these internal things that they've heard all their lives, and they just sort of assume they're true. And um, and we all have to check ourselves on things like that. So I think that's an important point that you made. Do we uh, do we have any final thoughts? Um, I oh wait oh I have one more question. Sorry, um, one more question. Um, do you have any um, 
body positivity book recommendations. Okay, do I do. Fiction or nonfiction? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Honestly, they can be either, and whatever okay. you want to recommend. Well, mine's a romance, so it's it's fiction, and it is Private Eye by Katrina Jackson, and um, it is a story about this um, woman. She is a sex worker and um she's plus sized and it's it's a lot of fun it's like a thriller but there's also like a secret government agency and there's it's it's really funny and um i love what uh katrina did um with the main characters uh well the conversation around the main character's body and how she was very confident in herself she didn't have that I saw any really bodily insecurities. In fact, she checked people a few times for assuming she would be, um, you know, shy or assuming that she would have some kind of hangups in, um, in being a sex worker or in being nude in front of other people. And she was just very open and just said, I love myself. I love my body. This is the way I look. And it was beautiful. And it was wonderful to see a, a plus size black woman be the person who was very eagerly pursued in this book. The, uh, her love interest was just falling over himself, over her. And it was so funny. And um, anyway, I highly recommend that book <laughs> if you can't tell. Um, Private Eye by Katrina Jackson. That sounds incredible. I want, I'm going to like write something right now. <laughs> I'm going to recommend Health at Every Size by Linda Bacon. <clears throat> it's something that I got my doctor to read, and that really changed our relationship for the better. It's just a nonfiction book where Dr. Bacon breaks down like all the reasons why the diet industry is fake and manipulative and exploitative and the real science behind a lot of the incorrect and false assumptions that we have about how body size and weight and body type uh, affect health and what are the actually meaningful indicators for health and how to go about looking for those in your life. And ultimately it really boils down to your health is a system of factors in your body and mind. And the number on a scale is completely arbitrary the number on the back of a pair of pants is completely arbitrary. You know, none of those things mean health. It is possible to be very thin and very unhealthy. And uh, the book, it was really, um, <clears throat> I read it when I was in the process of a yo-yo from having lost a hundred pounds at one point. And, uh, and it really opened my eyes to the possibility that I was really hurting myself trying to be somebody that my genes are not ever gonna support me being. And um, really made me change the way that I thought about myself and what mattered to me in terms of my health. And uh, in doing so, like really gave me an opportunity to talk to my doctor about stuff that, that I otherwise would not have had the opportunity to do. So highly recommended, literally life-changing. What was the name of the author again? Uh, it, they publish as Linda Bacon. I'm literally taking these down. I'm like, my TV, like I don't have like a TBR a gazillion miles long. Um, <laughs> Lainey, what about you? Um, well, this one you don't have to write down. Uh, so since our wonderful moderator is not going to say it. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> One of my suggestions is Never Say Never by Justine Mandel. <laughs> um, she's talked about it a little bit in this panel. Um, Bryn is a wonderful, strong character, regardless of what she looks like on the outside. Um, she's a wonderful character just in general. Um, and the way that she handles the people in her life, um, really, it's... It's an amazing book, especially for those that are actively seeking representation that doesn't feel shoved down your throat. 
Um, it doesn't feel like Bryn's entire character is the fact that she is a little bit larger. Um, she is who she is and she does not care if you like it or not. Um, <laughs> Many different ways. <laughs> um, but I also have another one as well. Um, the Almost Queen by Elise Murray is about a plus size green skin witch. Um, she is actively fighting for the freedom of her people that have been banished to the outer lands. And um, the corrupt government gets a hold of her um, and imprisons her. And she makes a deal with the king um, that she will pretend to be his wife if he will help her free her people. They may or may not fall in love. Um, but one of the things I love about this book is the dedication, which you won't be able to see, but it says to anyone who never saw themselves in the pages of fairy tales or wearing crowns in the movies, this story is for you. So it's a really awesome book. I'm a little, I'm a little biased on both of them, but. Uh, <laughs> they, may, they may or may not both be from Sword and Silk books. Um, yeah, but <laughs> But they are because I loved them so much. So um, anytime <laughs> you want any part of publish them if they, <laughs> if they weren't good, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Anytime you want any of my recommendations, they're all on that website because I, I have to fall in love with a book before we'll, we'll publish it. So. Um, I, I enjoyed The Upside of Unrequited by Becky Abertali. Um, she wrote a great character who has a lot like there is well first there's a great group of characters a lot of different people and her first love interest this character is this guy that she thinks is the right guy for her based on um his appearance and and the fact that he is like the one that is sought after and she's all excited to the for, about the fact that he might like her back and meanwhile she is also making friends with the plus size boy in her at her job who she really also uh gets along with kind of much better than the other guy and so her whole journey is about understanding why um, why she's more leaning towards the textbook attractive guy and whether or not what that says about her and whether or not that is something she wants. Um, and I just, I really enjoyed that book and um, really enjoyed the, the, the lead, um, the romantic lead character. Uh, he was great. So I, uh, I definitely would recommend that story. Um, I really tend to like a lot of Becky Albert Halley's stories. I think they're all very, I, I think in that way that they're, it's good in any book to see yourself, but it's also really great when you can see where other people will be able to find their opening and understand better um, the people that are not like them. And so I love that in books when I see that, that like, like the recommendations you all gave, there's this opening where people who are not that type, not the same body type can come in and gain a new understanding and, um, and hopefully we open eyes and change the way people think. Um, I really, really, really enjoyed this panel and working with all of you guys today and talking to you. Um, I do want to open it up for anyone, you know, to give final thoughts and then also to tell us where we can find you so we can all start, you know, following you and creeping on the internet. So <laughs> I'll start with Lainey. Lainey, tell us your final thoughts and. Uh, final thoughts. So if I had to sum up everything, I would say for the readers that are watching this panel that enjoy body diversity um, in their fiction, do what you can to support the artists and the authors that are putting this stuff out. You know, leave reviews, um, make sure you know you buy those books, you tell the authors that you appreciate it. The more the publishing industry sees that that is what the readers want, the more it will be published and the more it'll be available to you. Um, readers really control the industry. Um, you have the power to change things and you have the power to get these books published and to get these stories published. Um, just use your voice. Lainey, tell us where you're, where we can find you. You can find me on 
Twitter at Laney underscore B B E E. Or you can find Sword and Silk at swordandsilkbooks.com. I think for me, <clears throat> on kind of a similar note, like if you are out there and you're a reader and you think nobody in books ever looks like I do, it may be difficult to believe and it may be hard to find sometimes, but I guarantee somebody out there is writing a story about somebody that you will recognize yourself in. And just like keep looking, hang in there because uh, those books are out there and the people who wrote them are just waiting for somebody to read them and connect with them and, and tell them, hey, this was a meaningful experience. They're really, really ready to connect with you as a reader and just everybody can validate each other. And that's a really powerful experience. Um, for me, you can find me on Twitter as at McManleyPants. Uh, and you can... <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can find me at michaelgwilliamsbooks.com and from there there are links to like my Facebook and all that jazz uh, but Twitter is where I'm me <laughs> and Facebook is where I'm a guy with an author page and, uh, and my website is where I occasionally blog okay final thoughts I would say um, to talk to other uh, plus size fat authors. Um, I really want to say that I don't want anyone to ever feel pressured to, um, you know, be especially vulnerable um, for work, especially work that will be published and it will be seen by you don't know how many people. Um, I don't want anyone to ever feel like they have to. Um, you know, completely expose themselves and be really, really vulnerable with the world. You can just tell your stories also. You don't have to, you know, bear your soul for everyone. You can take care of yourself first. I think, I think that's an especially poignant note. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and um, you can find me everywhere at uh, Beatrice Iker on Twitter, on Instagram, and BeatriceIker.com, where I also blog occasionally with uh, poetry and prose, and sometimes tarot reading, so, yeah. Um, I guess my final thoughts would be along those lines, um, like you said, it, it's a personal choice to, to put yourself out there um and you shouldn't ever you're right you shouldn't ever feel like you have to because you represent a group be that representation for everybody um that is a choice that that, you, that each individual makes um i also think that it's super important in general for us to try to push towards a more exclusive publishing community i mean sorry more inclusive publishing community uh less exclusive more inclusive thank you um <laughs> And it's okay. to, you, you, you definitely got there. <laughs> I was like, um, yeah. but try to like make sure that that the people that we're throwing our support behind as readers, as writers, um, that we lift up authors of different types because and, and publishing officials of different types because those that's what's going to get the books out there. Um, having a wide variety of people sitting atop publishing would create a wide variety of books being released because they will find the people, they will understand, you won't get a lot of this, I didn't connect with the voice, that happens a lot in publishing because of a different type of voice. So um, it all starts, it, it can start from the from the bottom up uh, as far as supporting your writers as readers, finding the people that speak to you and, pub and uh, promoting them yourself with your reviews and, and word of mouth, but it also starts at the top going down as well, where uh, it's very important to have a publishing community that looks like the world um, and is not just one type of person. So uh, whenever, whenever that's something that's in your power, if you, you know, us, where we're dealing with a bunch of different publishing professionals here at Right Hive uh, coming in for the, the conference, I guess the important thing that I want to leave it with is the people that you lift are the people who get to make these decisions. And so you should always try to lift people who tell different stories or who look 
different from you or act different from you because those that's going to allow that inclusivity to spread. Um, you know, always keep your hand out to pull someone else up. So um, that's my final note. Uh, you can find me at justinemanzano.com. I'm on Twitter and Instagram mostly at justine underscore Manzano. Um, I'm other places too, but I, I agree with Michael. Like there's a difference between like me actually being around and me being that, you know, that author page that <laughs> posts stuff sometimes. Um, so yeah. That's I, it's hard to keep up all that stuff, um, and possibly at some point I'll be on TikTok because I think I'm supposed to be as a YA writer, but um, <laughs> I still haven't figured that out. Um, so that's uh, thank you all very much for joining me for this panel. Uh, I think we made a lot of important points, and I and I really enjoyed this conversation. I think uh, everyone had a lot of great stuff to add. Um, for anyone who is right, who is tuning into this, um, you can find other different types of content that is similar about inclusivity at Right Hive's YouTube channel where you'll probably see this. Um, we have a bunch of things from past conferences and from this current conference that cover similar topics. Um, and if you are joining us live here at the conference, we have should have right after this a Q and A live um, on the Red Hive Discord. So please come join us and uh, tell us what you thought of today's panel. Thank you, everybody, and um, goodbye from Red Hive. <laughs>